This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so it's a, a great pleasure today to introduce Ross Sozani. Um, Ross did her graduate work in Italy and then was a postdoc with Philip Benfi, and that's when I met her. And she did this absolutely beautiful work looking at how uh, developmental regulation interacts with a cell cycle, looking at the downstream gene rec network of short root and scarecrow in the cortex endodermal initial division and found cyclin D61 is downstream of that. So it was absolutely beautiful. And I have been very interested in how cell cycle interacts with cell identity. And so I loved her work when I saw that. And we've been friends ever since. Uh, we met at several conferences. And Roz is one of these people who's always doing something innovative. So I always love hearing what her latest thing is. Uh, she's got a beautiful publication in eLife with a new microscopy method to look at protein movement. She was telling me last night about a contraption she and a collaborator were building to image multiple routes simultaneously with live imaging. And she does beautiful um, gene regulatory network um, anal computational analysis. She's also teaching a a uh, joint class with an uh, engineer, right? With an engineer on uh, computational biology at North Carolina State University. So welcome, Roz, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for having me here. Um, it's true, our friendship goes back when uh, we were both interviewing for job at the same time, and I always cheer for her to get uh, the best offer because She's an outstanding scientist, an amazing person. So you're so lucky to have her here that uh, I'm trying to get her <laughs> to come to the triangle area. Uh, but so today, what I really like to do is to just spend a couple of minutes and to set up uh, why I'm working with plant in a broader aspect. And then I'm going to tell you three different stories. Uh, tendency, I try to always tell unpublished story, uh, but things don't develop that fast. So I'll, I'll spend most of the time talking about an unpublished story, and the other two, they were just uh, recently published uh, in eLife and Developmental Biology. So they will be short, and I apologize that they're already published, but maybe you haven't yet uh, seen them. And I would say, um, just let's keep this talk very informal. So just ask me any question that you want uh, during the talk. And now towards the end, I'm happy to change the speed of my talk and needs so that everybody is on board. And again, it will be about three stories. So uh, stay awake for the story you're most interested in. And I have an outline telling you when you can go to sleep and when you can wake up or etc. And um, with that, I'll uh, take on, thank you again, uh, Adrian, to having me here. And so um, my interest is really to, um, well, identifying other people did identify for me, but pursuing some of the grand challenges of uh, our century. And so what are these uh, grand challenges? growing our economy. Everybody wants our economy to get better, improving our health, of course, uh, protecting our environment and enriching our youth. We are at the university, so we are all agree with these four great challenges. And so why I am here, why plant biology? Well, there is a fifth and uh, I would say very important aspect that is feeding our world. And uh, for the graduate student um, in, uh, here at the talk, the, the, it's extremely important how you really position yourself in this uh, group of amazing scientists and trying to communicate to your parents, uh, the public, what is um, the need, why we need more food, um, well, we are a very growing population. Uh, by 2050, we're going to grow up to 9 billion people. Um, the Food and Agricultural Organization tell us that we need to increase food production by 70% if we want to uh, feed the world population. And so the very first things that one would say is, well, just plant more crops. But the problem is that another, let's say, uh, statistical 
scariness is that the arable land is declining. And I always joke that by, um, I work on Arabidopsis, it is a model plant, by 2050, we'll only see on the sidewalk Arabidopsis plant, and there will be not much arable land. And so, still, when I'm talking to my mother, I say, well, we need to provide more food. The arable land is uh, decreasing. And she would say, well, when I was a kid, um, well, let's say when I was a teenager, um, she, she said, we will put a lot of fertilizer so that even if you have a smaller um, land, you have a lot of um, crop. And so we all know from the first green revolution that that was great, but we know that now fertilizer are starting to harm the environment. So now we remain with these great grain challenge that we need more food we have less land and we want to provide enough food without arming the environment so how are we going to do that and so um i like this date and i just told my head of the department that i probably retire in 2050 when i say well i did anything i could up to that point to at least feed a little bit more people but um as a beginning uh, what you're going to see from me is all uh, research done on a model system, hoping that all the research and efforts we're putting in a model system will actually be then eventually uh, translated. And you don't need uh, this. It was not meant to be there, but that's okay. And so focus on the need, uh, feed more people. Um, basic approach is we are trying to re-engineer stem cell regulation. Our basic idea, very grounded uh, to the floor. I always joke, they say I'm very short, so I'm very close to the ground. So my idea is very grounded base. Um, if stem cell give rise to all the tissue and organ of a plant, what if we learn more about stem cell regulation? Can we actually modify uh, the architecture of a plant from the ground. So the idea here is to use everything that uh, we can gain from these model plants, Arabidopsis, and then eventually uh, translate that to a non-Arabidopsis plant and even to our um, to ourself, as exemplified by the Vitruvian man. So here is the um, talk for which you can stay awake or you can fall asleep. This is all unpublished data where I'm going to show you how we're going to, we obtain stem cell type um, transcriptional profile of genes. And then we kind of like had to gain more information about this. So we started to generate a gene regulatory network of this stem cell. So we'll be a little bit on the computational side. And then uh, if you're interested then in new in vivo imaging where you can obtain information about uh, movement of protein or for example in vivo protein-protein interaction where you can get down to the stoichiometry of protein interaction, then um, I'll wake you up and tell you about this story. And then the third one will be to, let's say, make the life of graduate student and postdoc better. So where we are trying to develop uh, imaging technique or at least uh, uh, imaging device that will increase the eye throughput. And so I had a just wonderful talk with Miguel uh, saying how eye throughput is actually very important um, even if you need to sacrifice on something else. And so um, for the whole three section of the talk, the main um, role is going to be played by not only Arabidopsis, but the root of Arabidopsis. Um, and mainly is why were we using Arabidopsis root is an extremely tractable system. It allows you to do um, a lot of um, cool things. The toolbox in terms of molecular biology, they are fantastic for all our colleagues and friends that have worked towards that. But especially for the, um, this talk, I would like you to remember two 
or just one aspect. Um, the stem cell that we are going to talk today are found at the tip of the root, and all the cells derive from uh, division, asymmetric cell division of the stem cell. And so when a daughter cell is uh, derived and then another cell is divided, then the cells are pushed upwards, such way that you can follow time along the longitudinal axis. So we have a developmental time along the root. Um, and then what we have is that um, the root is, it can be viewed as a concentric cylinder. And so you can reduce a 3D space into a 2D space because all these cells are radially symmetric with the exception of the vasculature, but we're not going to go into the details. So we can follow time and space. And so when you can deal with spatial temporal information, the best tool you could use, uh, for me at least, was to use the root. And so going into uh, right away uh, the talk, so we were fortunate enough that we were able to collect all the different stem cell markers of the root. Um, some we developed, some were from uh, talking with colleagues and say, oh, we are trying to get all the stem cell marker and these phenomenal colleagues um, are just sharing all their marker even before publication for a great collaboration. So we have all these different fluorescent marker of the different stem cells. What we can do? Well, we can obtain um, stem cell specific transcriptomic profile by, and so that we can identify stem cell genes. How we do that, I'm not going to go too much into the details, but we use fluorescent activating cell sorting. So we can uh, obtain, um, we can protoplast these plant. We obtain two population of cells, non-fluorescent protein and fluorescent protein, so that we have an enriched population of the different stem cell. And then we can do RNA-seq data. Everybody so far following? Great. Um, so with these data, what we did? Well, the first point, I had to sit down and say, well, as cool as it that we want to work on stem cell, we never really show, and there were no data whatsoever that the stem cell were actually transcriptionally different from non-stem cell. Okay, so we had to do that at first. We had to look at our stem cell, and then we said, well, um, are those different stem cells transcriptionally set apart from non-stem cell? And so we had uh, data, transcriptomic data from, uh, let's say, stage one that contains all the stem cell and um, transamplifying zone where cells divide very often. And then we have a stage two that contain elongating cells and stage three that will contain differentiated um, cells. And so from these uh, principal component analysis, so the very first point that I want to make here is a joke. When the very first time I saw this PCA, uh, this is the work of my uh, postdoc. Um, Angels, she is an electric and computer engineer. She never worked with uh, uh, biologists before. And when I saw that, I said, wait a second, we're working on Arabidopsis, not on Drosophila <laughs> embryo. What is going on here? And she said, no, 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 everything is on, is on the right track. What you're seeing here um, is gene and how they are different from themselves. So if you, um, I always take the second, and I actually ask a graduate student if he sees what is the difference. Do we have a volunteer here? <laughs> well, graduate students are going to have lunch with me, right? <laughs> so they're going to have a free lunch. Let's make it less of a free. Who is the graduate student that wants to take the lead and see if you see beside the Drosophila embryo, if you see any difference, if you see that the stem cell have a different transcriptional profile than the non-stem cell. Where are the graduate students? Raise your hand. <laughs> then now I need to pick you. So <laughs> only two? <laughs> They're hiding. <laughs> Wait a second. You're gonna have lunch with me, so I'm gonna see you in, in 30 minutes. Okay, you you kept your hand enough <laughs> that you seems go ahead. Do you see? 
seems like the more mature cells are farther along the right side of the prin first principal component, largely. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The 3D aspect of it is kind of hard for me to see. Right. So, big point, you're having a, a extra slice of pizza, if there is pizza for lunch, <laughs> because you deserved it. So, that was actually very nice, because we saw that, um, yes, stem cells were transcriptionally different than non-stem cell. What we realize is that um, stage one that contained some of the stem cell couldn't use for any further analysis because we have that stage one is, as we expected, close to the stem cell and the non-stem cell. So that was a very first um, positive result. That when you're starting your lab and you say, well, am I going the right direction? I said, it seems so. Yes, if we are just looking at the stem cell type specific expression, we're going the right direction because indeed they're different from non-stem cell. And so with that in mind, we identify that are specific for the stem cell only um, 100, uh, sorry, 1,600 genes of which um, 200 were transcription factors. And so we know exactly where all these different uh, genes are expressing, which stem cell and et cetera. And so with that in mind, then you could do 1,600 genes well, or 200 transcription factor. You would say 200. Well, we can do reverse engineer. We can order 200 knockout line and good luck to the graduate student and postdoc working with all these uh, mutants, right? Or um, we could strategize differently and then we sat down with my postdoc and say well given a lot of information that I'm going to give you in a second can we actually find a way that we rank what of these 1600 gene or these 200 transcription factor will most likely have a major role in stem cell function and so we sat down and we developed a computational pipeline. And I'm going to go in through the details in a second, but I wanted to tell you that uh, is a joke that I'm going to steal from somebody else. But I just heard uh, when you have a computational pipeline, you really want to show every single nitty gritty details. It's like when you have picture of your child and you want to show all the picture of your child to your friends. They don't care much. <laughs> so... I'm going to give you just a brief uh, overview of this computational pipeline, but I'm happy to give you any extra details that you need. So the computational pipeline is based on two major aspects. So is taking advantage of spatial temporal data. And so what are these spatial temporal data? Spatial is all the different stem cell marker transcriptomic profile. So cell type specific transcriptomic profile and temporal data as I was telling you the root has embedded in the longitudinal axis time so the temporal data is all the gene expression at every single developmental time of the root so we had a beautiful data set already available from um, Siobhan Brady showing um, dividing up the root in uh, 12 section that so we consider that a 12 time point um, data set and so the computational pipeline has a very first uh, clustering step that is a normal clustering step that everybody uh, may want to use and mainly is based on gene co-expression the main assumption of it is that if a gene is express in one specific stem cell then that gene should function in that stem cell so they're uh, practically dividing up the gene if their expression is specific to one stem cell or two two three stem cell and etc and then the novel aspect of this computational pipeline is uh, dynamic vision network inference and is um, very simple concept. The idea here is that if you find, um, if you have a regulator, you expect that this regulator is controlling a gene either in the time point 
of uh, the same time point or one time point after. And so it's uh, based on a first assumption of um, Markov, where we saying, well, given the expression in time lapse zero and time lapse one, what is the probability that this gene is regulating this other gene? And so you do this inference throughout the 12 data point. And then uh, the other aspect that you can have is that you can see if there is a directionality of regulation. So if he's uh, up-regulating one gene at the time lapse one or if he's down-regulating, okay? Oh, and those are uh, steps of the network. Is, um, the idea here was to look at intercluster connection. So first of all, considering um, just network that are for a specific stem cell. So that you will look at the network of genes that function just for that stem cell and also intercluster so that they function in one stem cell but they also have a connection with another stem cell because all of these are uh, multicellular organisms and we know this, there is cell-to-cell -cell communication. And then uh, you're going to see in a little bit the resulting network. But before showing you the resulting network, you say, oh, this is all look good, but how can you actually prove that this is solid and uh, reliable and et cetera? So um, computationally, we need to do a couple of steps before we can say we are confident about our inferred network because it's still based on probability, right? And so the next two steps are how we validate it in silico practically our new algorithm. So our new algorithm is, the name is Genius. And if you have a better name, we still have uh, the chance to change it. I really don't like it. But Genius stands for uh, Gene Expression Network Inference from Spatial Temporal Data. Horrible name, but uh, there's no way that we can find a better acronym. But uh, what, we, what we were extremely pleased is um, when you have a new algorithm, generally you challenge your algorithm through a Dream 4, now there is a Dream 5 uh, competition where you have other existing algorithm, existing data sets that they are challenged one against each other and then you can choose specific metrics, for example, precision, area under the rock, and then Practically, these are indirect um, measurement of the ratio of true positive and false positive. And genies always perform best. And especially the important aspect here is if you have a node of 100 nodes or a little bit that 100 nodes, they tell us that we will have very low false positive so that our graduate student and postdoc will be happy to go after um, genes because they're not going to quote-unquote waste um, their time. Uh, and the other aspect though that is currently a limitation and we um, are working on it, it, it gives us confidence if we model 100, 200 gene network. So I told you that we had 1,600 genes that were specific for the stem cell and then it's not by chance, but I put that there are 200 transcription factors. So from now on, what you're going to see is the transcription factor network of the stem cell because we were highly confident for just modeling these 200 genes, and we couldn't really model the 1,600 genes. But we're working on developing different steps so that we can deal with many more genes. Another way that you can... No, an additional way that you should validate new algorithm is with uh, using in vivo data. So, for example, here is an example. For example, is an example of um, a known network in a cell type in the root where we have these master regulator, downstream genes, and etc. And so, we compare um, our new algorithm with existing algorithm, mainly the one that is often uses arachne, and what you can see here, well, 
it performs very well. It finds four true positive, one false negative, uh, mainly because there is a regulation back of this transcription factor. But what I would like you to see here is the difference between two pan these two panels. That our uh, new algorithm, what it can do, it can find the directionality, as I was telling you. So this arrow will actually tell you who is regulating whom and the sign of the regulation, if it's an activator or a repression. And the other thing that you can clearly see is the difference in size of these nodes. So we use a matrix that tells you the importance of the different transcription factor based on some aspect. And this aspect could be um, outgoing edges, so outgoing regulation. It could be on in how many feed forward loop this gene is involved, how many feedback loop, how many by fan loop. So you look at the uh, network topology, and based on the network topology, you can infer um, a ranking, and so you can infer a size of the node. So that if you were a graduate student, uh, you will not put that much effort into C2, but you will put much effort into these uh, APL uh, gene that indeed we know is a master regulator of flow and development. So the next that you're gonna see, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so you want an extra pizza slice, I got it, you're very hungry. <laughs> the edges are also different sizes. Uh, yes, big good. Something else, or? Yes, no, excellent point. The edges are also uh, different sizes because we have actually a weight associated with it. So um, the point here, when we cluster, we do k-mean clusters, and we run it for 10,000 times. And so based on the k-mean, some of the gene will go in one cell, in one cluster, some of them will go in another cluster. And so sometimes the edges don't exist. So what we do, we set a threshold, let's say 0 0.6, and then uh, we drop all the edges that are less important so that we don't have that many interactions. Yes, so it's based on, uh, the weight and the number of how many times this happens throughout um, the inference algorithm. Yep, very good point. Extra, which lab, which lab are you in? <laughs> Adrian and Mike. Oh, uh, fantastic graduate student. <laughs> okay, so what you have here is the resulting network and is as I'm proud of my daughter, I'm proud of this network because it's the real very first picture of all these transcription factor uh, for which there were 20 years of work. And what we can see is that from this middle part of the network, we do really recover all, and with the dollar sign is the happy uh, myself, we all recover genes for which in literature there are data confirming their role in stem cell specification, in stem cell maintenance, uh, root <coughs> development. So what this network is showing, just to make it brief, in the middle is showing all the stem cell that are, in, uh, all the stem cell genes that are important for the maintenance. And then on the side, at the beginning I was calling this the spaghetti meatball disaster, but then um, there's an Italian and I can, I guess. Uh, but then biologically, it makes a lot of sense. All of these large nodes are important for the maintenance specification of the stem cell. And all of these uh, subclusters, then we look into them and we identify genes that have an importance in, for example, specific stem cell type function. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you next is that, um, well, we took two um, stem cell identity network and validated them in two different ways. So the very first way was to look at the um, chromatin immunoprecipitation, so protein DNA interaction of these specific xylem uh, stem cell. So chromatin immunoprecipitation using this known transcription factor that is actually 
the transcription factor was working while I was a postdoc. And then we also look at my own, that's fine, my own gene expression data while I was a postdoc of um, the induction of these uh, genes. And so what we could find in this network that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, five out of the six downstream genes were confirmed by chromatin immunoprecipitation and by gene expression profile. Uh, we still have one that is not confirmed, but we're working on um, using new uh, molecular technique to see if this is a real uh, target or is a false positive. The other that I would like to spend, oh, and this panel was supposed to come up later, but that's okay, is the quiescent center network. So we were fortunate enough that um, just recently um, Martin Yapnowski have shown an important role of this uh, gene transcription factor entity in the quiescent center. We had uh, great work done on Bravo showing function uh, of this gene in the quiescent center, but then we all, and then we have known uh, platelet one, platelet two, platelet six, that, that we all know that are important for QC uh, function. And then we focus our attention on this gene, uh, periantia, and what we identify is that, you can believe me, but I have uh, another picture with the marker inside, where we see uh, QC phenotype. So the QC is this little hand part, the smiley part of the root. This is a little bit crooked. It will need some braces in terms of smiles. It has uh, some uh, crooked uh, um, quiescent center. And what we know from many years of work is that if you don't have a functional quiescent center, the distal stem cell, that are the columella stem cell, they differentiate. And so what we uh, obtained with a collaborator, a fantastic collaborator from Spain, um, the inducible line of this uh, gene, periantia, what you have is that you have extra columella stem cell. And the reason why I'm saying that this is a PSPI staining, where in red you can see the starch granule. So you have that in a mutant, the starch granule are really close to the quiescent center, suggesting that there's no columella stem cell. And here you see extra layer of columella stem cell. And so we did, uh, and I'm gonna sh not show you in the details, uh, we did a mathematical model to uh, predict the function of PEN, but as biologists, and that is the reason why the paper is not yet out, is under revision because the reviewer, thank you to the reviewer, they asked for uh, more biological data. What we did, and that is the same mutant, but this time, with the quiescent center marker, so you can see that it has crooked quiescent center. We did RNA seq, so we look at the gene expression profile of these um, of the gene in this mutant compared to wild type. And that day, I think I was close to cry. So happy I was because if I take a second and I go back to all of these stem cell niche network. What we find is that 70% of all the stem cell niche and the one uh, in the quiescent center, they're all down-regulated in these uh, pan mutants. So we have the, our short root gene is down-regulated, all the platelet gene are down-regulated, all the other uh, stem cell genes are all down-regulated, suggesting that our network identify a master regulator for quiescent center function and um, stem cell maintenance. Extremely happy. So that was the very first part of the talk. Uh, the clock. What time did I start it? 11.15? Perfect. Because it, the, the rest of the talk will be just telling you and pointing you to this paper because unfortunately we don't have enough data to make another uh, story. But so this very first part is that we develop a gene regulatory network inference that takes advantage of any kind of spatiotemporal data. So for example, we have used now these in collaboration with Dan Cheatwood and use um, tomato leaf development to infer 
network involving leaf thickness. Um, we use it for strawberry development, from the green strawberry to the red strawberry. So anytime you have a time course and uh, cell type or tissue type or integration line uh, data set, you can combine these two data sets and get uh, useful information. So now these are going to be just 10 minutes uh, long, and then I'll be happy to have many more questions. Uh, just going back to the initial image that I show you, the root is a um, concentric cylinder. Uh, what I told you at the very beginning is that all the different stem cells give rise to all the different tissue through asymmetric cell division. And um, work done while I was a postdoc in Philip Banfi's lab and that I started while I was in uh, Philip, so it's a great collaboration we had, um, was to study a key aspect um, regarding these two important transcription factors that regulate the asymmetric cell division of one kind of uh, cell type that is the cortex endodermis initial. So in a short root mutant, you don't have to remember the name, but they will come up very often. Short root, just remember that this mutant was identified, had a very short, short, short root. And then scarecrow was identified because um, it also lacked this asymmetric cell division and it only had one ground tissue. And so it was named after the Wizard of Oz. There were two other mutants. Teeny man and lion, they also were missing some other cell type. And this was, I think, called scarecrow because at that time it was considered that the ground tissue was the brain of the root, perhaps. I was not there, so I, I don't put my hand on fire. But remember, short root, teeny tiny root and scarecrow, the one without the brain. Uh, but what we know that is not just specific to this transcription factor, we have now plethora of data showing that about 20, 30 percent of transcription factor are actually moving transcription factor. So they move from where they are uh, produced to adjacent cell layer. So this transcription factor is producing the vasculature of the root and it moves to the adjacent uh, cell layer where it activates the downstream target scarecrow. And then we know that short and scarecrow interact together to regulate um, this asymmetric cell division of the ground tissue. And so we had a mathematical model and uh, we really never asked the question, is the quantification of this movement important if we want to have a, a more quantitative model? And is the stoichiometry of the protein complex important? You don't know until you test that, right? And so we started to collaborate with the scientists, uh, uh, physicist that you see Irvine, that he started uh, just back then to use um, fluorescent correlation spectroscopy, scanning fluorescent correlation spectroscopy, to obtain information about movement of uh, protein and protein-protein interaction. So I don't want to go too much into the physics details, but is practically when you have your uh, sample and you're looking under, for example, a laser scanning microscope, a confocal, um, I know you tend to just have the most beautiful picture, right? But the background things that is going on is that um, every time you have a fluorescent protein and it goes in and out your observation volume, that is your confocal objective. And then when it goes in and out your observation volume, what it does, it emits intensity fluctuation. And if you follow the intensity fluctuation over time and over space, and then you fit uh, using an autocorrelation function, you can do indeed obtain information about the movement, the concentration, and if you do, uh, uh, dual fluorescent cross correlation and you have two fluorescent protein, one that gives an intensive fluctuation in, for example, the GFP channel and one that gives you intensive fluctuation in the red channel, you can cross correlate and fit to this cross correlation function and get information about the stoichiometry of the protein complex. So that, for example, you don't care much if these protein are 
close to each other. So if you will need to do protein-protein interaction using FRET, but they can just be in the same protein complex, even if they are far apart, they will still uh, cross-correlate and it will still give you information about the protein-protein interaction. How big is your scanning region? Uh, so the scanning region, very good question. Um, it depends. So it depends on, uh, let's see if I have an image here. Uh, no, okay. The scanning region could go through two or three cells, so is a uh, few microns. Uh, I'm trying to remember the top of my head. Just a few microns because the cells in the root are very small. But you can have as long as you want um, with no problem. Let me walk you through a little bit and see if I can get um, from you another question. Because, so the, the point here is that with raster image correlation spectroscopy is that you do a scanning of a 2D frame. And so it could be as big as you want. The important is that, for example, that the pixel um, size is smaller than your point spread function. So that is more informative than you can image whatever you want. Uh, you will just have longer scanning. But the important is that, so your point spread function that is the observation volume of your objective is tendency around 300 nanometer and you need to have at least five to six pixels in each point spread function to have enough correlation. I hope that that answer your question. And so uh, what I'm gonna present you and that we use this imaging technique in the plant for the first time is raster image correlation spectroscopy. And I'm gonna go into the details in a second that you can really calculate movement. And so what I want to say here is a second and tell you that we have to use diffusion coefficient as a term, but that doesn't mean that your protein are diffusing. They can be actively transported. Um, it's just that the physics terms is diffusion coefficient, but it, they can be really actively transported as in this case. And then uh, what I'm gonna show you is a line scan where we can tell really the intra and intercellular movement of a protein and the number and brightness. So these are the three techniques that I'm gonna spend the next five minutes to it, uh, where we can see the oligomeric state of a protein at the cellular level. So the raster scan is really a raster of your 2D image. So you, you trace, you send your laser along a line uh, and then along a frame so that you can image the cell type of interest or the two different cell type of interest. In this case, it will be cells that contain the vasculature where we know the protein is produced and then uh, cells where the protein moves to. And so without going too much into the details, what we could already see is that there is a differential movement of this transcription factor in this cell type versus these other cell type where it moves. And so we knew from uh, previous molecular data that this could be because in these endodermal cell is where short root interacts with scarecrow. And so we wonder whether the slow movement of short root was because of scarecrow. And so in this case, we really can quantify this movement and is significant and we know that it caused an asymmetric cell division, we can see that in absence of scarecrow or in a scarecrow RNAi line, now in the endodermis, what we have is that short root now moves like it will move in the vasculature. Suggesting that yes, indeed, uh, scarecrow is important for the movement of short root. Um, the other thing that we look is, well, what is the movement and how scarecrow restrict short movement. 
And so there are PCF data where PCF is practically um, correlating all the intensity fluctuation along a line that spans different cells. So that you can ask a question, does this protein move from this cell type to this cell type to this cell type and vice versa? And if there is a differential movement, where this differential movement is coming from? And so in order for you to actually uh, read through the heat map that I'm going to show you in a second, um, I'm going to just show you an exemplify version. So the heat map or carpet that we obtain are going to be looking like that. So in the x direction is uh, space, in the y direction is time. If a protein is moving cell to cell to cell to cell in a diffusive route in this way without any uh, active movement, what you're going to see in blue is the representation of the movement between cells with uh, diffusion. If you instead don't see um, diffusion, so if you only see blue means uh, correlation, so movement, black means no movement, if you see that you only see movement here but not here, then this will be your exemplify uh, heat map. If you instead see a delay in the movement, so you will see a arch formation that tells you that it's taking some time for this protein to move from cell to cell, but eventually it will move. And so we ask the question, well, what is the movement of short root from where it's produced to where it ends up? And so what we can see is that it moves we know that short root moves through plasmodesmata, the, the cytoplasmatic connection. It moves through um, one cell and another through a delay movement. But then when we look at the direction, like the directionality of the movement, so going back to the vasculature, that kind of would correspond to the fact that at that point, short root is moving lower than in the vasculature, we can clearly see that short root does not move back into the vasculature. And so I've shown you before that if we take away scarecrow, he moves faster, now short root. And so we look um, at the intra and intercellular movement of short root in a scarecrow mutant background. And fair enough, what we find is that in a scarecrow RNAi line, uh, we can track that short root is going back to the vasculature. So this was to show you that indeed we can quantify the movement and we can really um, give a route of the movement of this transcription factor. And then we can also uh, look in how they interact. So this is the background. Uh, you just need to believe me here. Uh, we need to calibrate every time with a control line that is a monomeric form, where, for example, uh, monomeric form are exemplified by these uh, blue pixels. When we look at uh, short root oligomeric state, what we're seeing, if you imagine here is a root, this is the vasculature where it's produced, and this is the nuclei of the endodermis where it's moving. What we see is that there is a percentage of a monomeric form of short root just in the vasculature, while there is a higher oligomeric state in terms of dimers and tetramel in the endodermis where it interacts with scarecrow. So again, we ask the question, um, if it interacts with scarecrow, is um, the oligomeric state of short root affected by the absence of scarecrow? And so what we are looking here um, is more or less the same orientation, you, you can clearly see that in the nuclei of the endodermis where now scarecrow is no longer there, short root is just as a monomer. And so that tells us that scarecrow is practically a bridge bringing together two short root uh, protein. And so what we did, we took an additional step and look at the cross correlation. So we label short root with the GFP, we label scarecrow with the M cherry, you can clearly see where they are expressed, short root, uh, scarecrow. Usually you will just look at the co-localization and say, fair enough, but what we actually went is where they interact, how they interact. So this is the uh, correlation map where you can qualitatively see with the blue dots where they are interacting 
in a stoichiometry of one to one and the green dots where they are interacting in a stoichiometry of two to one. And here is the um, stoichiometric histogram where we can see that there are uh, mostly one short and were scarecrow with red exemplifying the highest probability to find this transcription factor um, in a stoichiometry one to one, but also that you have a high probability to find two short root with one scarecrow. And here is the quantification. So everything that I show you qualitatively, uh, we can also obtain the quantification. So 80% of these is um, of the protein protein interaction is one to one and two to one is um, limited to 15%. So why I'm telling you all this story? Well, I'm telling you all this story because it's extremely cool to be and go into the details of identifying the movement and quantify the movement and the stoichiometry. But the idea we had was to obtain these information and develop a mathematical model that will give us information about the dynamics of these two transcription factors. So this is the mathematical model that we use is a series of ordinary differential equation where we are uh, modeling, for example, short root in the vasculature, short root in the endodermis, and then from our data, we know that there are um, dimers of short root in the endodermis. So that is the equation for that aspect. And then we have the uh, model scarecrow. And this is a yield term because we know the short root regulates scarecrow. And then we have the complex one to one of short root scarecrow and the complex of two to one short root scarecrow. So all the information that I told you, we practically retranslate in a mathematical model. It's like you will translate from the English to the Italian. All of these is what I just told you from the biology into the mathematical model. Uh, we ran up a sensitivity analysis and find out that diffusion coefficients were extremely important, but let me tell you what the model tell us and how we validate it. So what these um, first outcome simulation of the model tells you is that uh, we don't know anything about short root, so short root is produced and it stays constant. We can do much about that until we identify upstream regulator of short root. In the red line is the um, expression of scarecrow over time. And what you can see is that about uh, 2.53 hour is when you reach the highest expression of scarecrow. And that what you can learn here is that as soon as scarecrow is produced, is uh, sequestered by short root, and you have the formation of a short root scarecrow uh, one to one protein complex. Only with time taking place at about nine hours, we start to see that the two to one scarecrow short root complex takes place. And so, what we did, we practically uh, validated this mathematical model by using a short root inducible system where we put a scarecrow. Uh, transcription line, and what we can see is that after we induce short root, so like we'll do the mathematical model the simulation here, as soon as we induce short root, at about three hours we start to see scarecrow expression, and that will fit that very well. The other things that we are now working on is that uh, you can see that at all the um, solution reaches a steady state, so they reach a plateau. What that means, well. We know that about 16 to 18 to 24 hours is when the stem cells start to divide, but we really didn't have any way to track and follow uh, stem cell division over time. So these still remain the part that we're working on and understand the second outcome of the model. Um, and so the second part of the talk, and the next one I'll just glance through is okay, is really that uh, scanning fluorescent correlation spectroscopy allow you to quantify parameter that were not that easy to quantify uh, before. And then all of these quantitative measurements, they can really be put into a mathematical model that is able to uh, tell you what are the dynamic of your system. And so these, that in this talk I'm telling you it was a natural progression. Well, we started to use these before we got these data is to develop new technology to do long time course. 
And so the long time course that I'm talking about is to using a live sheet uh, microscopy, where I'm gonna just tell you um, not the advantages, but the limitation that we had to overcome. So with this system, you can grow one sample at a time. And as I was telling you, you need to get high throughput to get your graduate student and postdoc happy. So we wanted to, if you want to do a five days time course, then you have, and you want 12 biological replicas, your graduate student is working for a week for the next 12 weeks on a single project, and you know how it goes. Most of the time, experiment fails, so it's gonna take six months, so then you get one uh, real good data set. So what we did, um, we collaborated with an engineer in the Department of Industrial and System Engineer and with Tim Horn, and we um, developed a system that used the same exact um, aspect and spec of the light sheet microscope that we're using. But at this time now, we 3D printed an imaging chamber that we called MAGIC. It was really MAGIC. Multi-sampler abdopsis growth and imaging chamber where we could image at least four samples at a time rather than one. So rather than wait 12 weeks, now you get that you image one plant, you rotate this revolving chamber, you image the second plant, you rotate, so you have four biological replicates right there. So you reduce a lot the time and the cost. These things cost a lot. Um, and so currently we have a prototype that holds more than four because we want uh, to run just a couple of biological replicates and have enough statistics. Um, so we tried out this system using a marker for cell division and currently we use an existing pipeline in Fiji, but we are working with the late tech and computer engineer, um, Cranus Williams, an amazing collaborator in the field, to develop our own um, automatic image pipeline to calculate cell division uh, come, over, coming over time, especially for the stem cell. Uh, we validated, this is the existing pipeline. We're happy to share, it's practically, um, coming up from Fiji, so extremely um, useful. What we could be able to measure was uh, um, all the different new um, cell division using our system and using the existing uh, system from Zeiss. And that um, you can see that along the time our system, plants are very happy and uh, they keep on dividing you on that. And so we image more uh, plants for more than 48 hours. And uh, the nice part is that now we can do a lot of experiment where we change the design of this uh, chamber where we can do drug treatment, uh, uh, temperature treatment because we have a temperature sensor and so on and so forth. So the end of the talk is kind of like the take home message different talk but all together uh, our umbrella question is how can we really understand stem cell regulation so that we can manipulate stem cell regulation and so it's really the triangulation and work of um, biology computational biology and develop a new uh, technique and so that was exemplified by uh, modeling uh, cell type specific expression and the idea here, again, my good friend, the Vitruvian man, is eventually, so there are known animal stem cell network player, can we actually obtain the end full uh, plant stem cell uh, genes in the Rabidopsis? And so this is uh, an old picture, but a couple of more people were added to the group, but this is the core group we started with uh, work today, that I shown you was from the postdoc, Angels de Luis Balaguer, an electric and computer engineer, um, PhD. Uh, my PhD student, Adam and uh, Natalie. And then great collaborator uh, from NC State, the engineer Timothy Horn and Kranos Williams and uh, great collaborator throughout. And funding from uh, NSF, um, a career grant and uh, bilateral grant with the UK, an NSF BBCRC grant. And um, with that, I take any question. I'm so sorry that I ran uh, at the clock, but I'll take any question.
I know, it was a lot. <laughs> I hope you left a little bit in between. So for your, your gene expression studies, the first thing you do is take your roots for, for the, the RNA-seq and you digest the syllables away. Mm -hmm. You sit there and they get um, isolated into protoplasts. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've lost the symplastic continuity and presumably these cells are enormously stressed. So do you have an idea of what that does to the overall topology of your gene network? No, I don't. Is is um is a concern that we all keep in our back mind to do the protoplasting. What I can tell you is that all the different lines are treated the same way. So if there are genes that are differentially regulated by the actual protoplasting system, they will be discarded because they will have the same change in expression over samples. Um, the other aspect is that we need to get cell type specific expression and that is so far what we can do best. But uh, yeah, you're right. We is um, an hour and a half protocol for which, yes, a lot of gene will change their expression profile because of the stress, but you should normalize and lose this gene and so probably we will lose some genes, but the point here is at least the gene that you're gonna go after, like for example, the Priyantia gene, clearly show that has a role in uh, the stem cell function. Yeah, I mean, you can try orthogonal approaches like laser capture to see if you can validate well, that. So I'm wondering whether, are people doing that? Or is so, um, so uh, we are doing laser capture, but for example, we are doing laser capture where we cannot do for acid activating cell sorting. So we have a project with uh, poplar trees where we can clearly show and follow the morphology of the stem cell for secondary growth and we do laser capture. But for example, for these, those are very teeny tiny uh, roots. And so it's not that easy. It's, um, it's not that easy. Yeah, but good point. One could think to do intact or so on, but. So far, we're happy what we get, but it's, it's always, you need to keep that in your back mind. Yes, yeah, please. Uh, so the, the pipeline for the GRN yeah. is pretty cool. So I'm just wondering, did you consider about the movement of the transcription factor to measure in the protein level or the MR? Uh, as a, yeah, as a you, you are totally on point. You want to come in my lab and work in my lab? Please do, because I'm always uh, telling my graduate student, can we in any way from the gene regulatory network infer which are the genes that are actually moving or et cetera? We will not be able to until we also have protein information. But that is a key point. These genes move around, and so we should get to the point where we develop uh, computational model that predicts which transcription factor are moving. But I think we need to get to the protein level and add, overlay the transcriptomic and the proteomic. So far, the limitation is that with transcriptomic, RNA and DNA, you amplify, you can start with very little material. With proteomic, we are not yet there to get cell type specific proteomic profile. Yeah. So going back to the question that you let Joe shine so much on, um, one <laughs> of the, um, so when you did that principal component analysis, yeah. one of the questions, you, people always show principal component analysis, but never tell us what the components, what, what are the basis of the components that you're doing that? And it gets back to Joss's question, yeah. because are there components of that gene expression that you could more easily explain associated with making protoplasts than True. anything else? True. So we are indeed doing what you're telling for the project with uh, Huka and Terry Long on iron deficient condition in uh, flow and development. We are indeed looking more into the specific of the different uh, um, PCA components and so on. For these, it was just a simple, uh, let's say way out to say, well, am I crazy or not that the stem cell are different than non-stem cell? Because that is actually the ground truth. If they would not have been different, why to do the work that I'm doing? So. Yeah, but it's a good point. I just, um, yeah, I just actually said in the talk that explain exactly 
what you're saying. And I went to my postdoc and I said, you need to look into these because we need to really show for these other projects. Yeah, you're completely right. Uh, I just have a question. Um, so I don't know much about the scarecrow. Mm -hmm. And I looking at your data, I, it's very wonderful. You show me one to one stoichiometry mm -hmm. for me, and then over time it's two to one. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wonder whether it has something to do with the mode of activity of scarecrow. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful question, Elena. So the sad part is that I really wanted to show the new set of data. Uh, but they were just too preliminary. So what my graduate student, and that goes back to your question, what my graduate student saw is that in another cells where they are both expressed, the quiescent center, the stoichiometry is actually flipped around. And what we're seeing, so we see that we have two scarecrow and one short root. And what we are seeing is that you have a two short root, one scarecrow, right? starting when uh, the cell will be close to division. So the stem cell, the CEI, the stem cell divides about 18 to 24 hours. Um, it divides symmetrically. While the quiescent center is a less mitotically dividing cells, but eventually divides a 72 hour. Or what I would like to see is, for example, does the stoichiometry changes in the Quiescent center, if we, if we treat with brosinosteroid, the quiescent center divides faster. So what we're trying to do is to see if the stoichiometry changes if there is a change in the cell division so that we can link that and start to see a correlation and then go after the causation. If it's really the stoichiometry underlying the timing of division or what. Yeah, we don't know. We, we, so that is why I... Mike, I hope I could show this data. Yes, please. Uh, this is not a serious question. Oh, go ahead. I'm not a serious, uh, <laughs> as you can see, I'm not a serious speaker as well. Yeah. Is she convinced that the world is going to be better fed? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm a, a yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a good point. It's, so the point there is, rather than convince my mom that the world would be better fed, is a message that I would like to send saying, it's always important to take five minutes and see why we're doing what we're doing. Because it's very basic what I'm doing. It's basic biology. And so if I were to tell my mom what I'm doing, she would be, zhu, zhu. I don't get it. But if I'm telling the big picture, then she says, oh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and so the hope is that um, we'll be able to. But So that is mainly for graduate student and postdoc. Always try to picture your research in a broad context so that your parents are proud of you. <laughs> and they give you presents. Right, so one announcement, the graduate student lunches in 413 Man Library. Let's thank Miles again. Sorry, that this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.